A sampling of Alan E. Norse vintage science fiction paperbacks plus one dick that's going to be explained later. Hi, I'm Gary Lovisi, and uh, this time I'd like to talk about one of my favorite science fiction writers, Alan E. Norse. Uh, Norse was a doctor who, um, uh, before he uh, began practicing, uh, had a career as a science fiction writer, wrote, some, wrote a bunch of stories, and he was very successful as a, as a science fiction writer in the uh, 1950, early 1950s. And he basically um, specialized in uh, juvenile fiction, or uh, what they would call today YA, young adult fiction, books that were for, um, for uh, teenagers or uh, young, young people. Uh, especially teenage boys and high school age boys, college age boys, like that. Um, but um, the thing is, his books never, um, they were never simple. He never uh, wrote down to any uh, readers. Uh, he took his uh, young, um, young readers seriously and uh, always wrote uh, really excellent stories that, Basically, uh, they weren't really science fiction for kids, like what you would think of, but they were science fiction that had uh, young people as the heroes or as the center uh, piece in the, in, the, in the novels and stories. And in that way, they were called juvenile fiction. He wrote for Winston, he wrote for McKay, David McKay Publishing, and others. And, uh, and then they were reprinted by Ace Books and Pyramid and other, uh, even Scholastic books in paperback. We're going to take a look at a few of them now. Uh, one, of the, one of the first ones is, uh, in no particular order, and this is just a sampling of some of his books that I happen to have and I happen to like. I, I read him when, um, when I was a kid, and uh, I really enjoyed his stuff. It was really, really good. And he's, a, he's a sci one of the science fiction writers, I think, who's uh, kind of, you know, sadly unacknowledged today. And uh, I just like to, uh, I'm going to do this on him because um, because his books are really cool. They're great stuff to read. Also, I have a hardcover book that has some interesting uh, material uh, enclosed in it that I got as a gift. And there's um, something else that I'm going to share at the end that I think would be uh, very interesting. So without further ado, we're going to look at the first book, Scavengers of Space. It's Ace D-541, and it's from... 1959, and um, his books, a lot of them dealt with, uh, you know, uh, young people involved in fantastic adventures in space, and this one has to do with uh, asteroid mining, which would be a topic that comes up in, uh, in some of the other books also. Uh, exploration of space and how uh, people are going to get resources and uh, how, how people are going to live in space and on different uh, colonies. And in Scavengers in Space, you have a, uh, asteroid miners that are, um, that are um, living and working out in the asteroid between, uh, asteroids between uh, Mars and Saturn. And so that's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a rousing adventure story. Uh, it's science fiction. And um, also, a lot of the things that his, his protagonists are young, are young guys that uh, there's always a love story involved. It's not, there's no, there's no sex because, uh, first of all, uh, this was science fiction in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, and they didn't have, you know, sex. But there was love in the sense that sometimes there was a, maybe you and your best friend was, uh, was a rival for the attentions of, uh, uh, of, a, of a special girl or... Uh, a young a young man was having uh, difficulties trying to uh, to uh, arrange uh, a, a love uh, love life with with a, with a girl who maybe is is pretty hard headed and he's hard headed and so they they kind of clash and so you had that kind of uh, love tension uh, you know but uh, but it always turns out good in the end and they're great stories. The next one is uh, Ace D three sixty six from. Uh, 1959. Uh, it's written with J.A. Meyer, and it's a paperback original, and it's The Invaders Are Coming, and that has a great uh, Amsh cover, tough guy, uh, tough guy cover art. Um, story over here is uh, that uh, there's a, uh, 
atomic uh, nuclear reactor uh, at this time that's uh, being um, some, some mysterious doings going on with this nuclear reactor. And it turns out that uh, there's a fifth, fifth columnist, a fifth column in the uh, United States and the fifth column is uh, aliens from uh, outer space. And uh, they're trying to uh, sabotage the uh, energy program. Uh, and um, the story is, uh, is, is, a really, is a really good one. It's, uh, it's, one, of his, it's one of his uh, more, more exciting and uh, rousing tales. Uh, then again, as, as, as uh, Norse was a doctor, uh, he also did uh, books that had to do with uh, m medicine in the future, and one that I really liked a lot. Uh, it's uh, Scholastic uh, published this in uh, it's number T six twenty five six twenty five, and it was published in uh, first printing was in December nineteen sixty four, and um, it was originally a McKay hardcover, and it's Star Surgeon. This is about doctors in the future. And the cover art isn't so science fictional because uh, 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 Scholastic Books wasn't a uh, uh, specifically a science fiction publisher. So you can see like Ace, you know, you can see right here on the covers that you're getting science fiction. The spaceships, asteroid belts, spacemen, helmets, and all of that. Here you have just really doctors, kind of a modern setting. You see the this, the planet in the in the background and all of that you know, as they're doing an operation, but um, great story and uh, it's a great book. And just to show you the back covers, and scavengers in space, and uh, the invaders are coming. Beware the masters of panic. These were the aliens that were influencing the uh, the United States. And they're trying to get them to not use nuclear power. As nuclear power was looked at as a benef benefit in those days, and we should probably look at it as today that way. Um, another book that I read, actually, I marked this down. I read this in two days in 1977 when I was 25 years old. The Counterfeit Man and Other Science Fiction Stories by Alan E. Norris. It's a... Uh, Another Scholastic book, T941, and the uh, first printing on this is from 1967. And again, you see, like, uh, uh, Scholastic didn't really know what to do, kind of, with the cover. It's 11 stories, and the funny thing is, is uh, I don't really remember any of the stories in this book. But I do remember that when I read this book, all of the stories were really good. It's kind of funny. I mean, you know, I read this 43 years ago. I read this book, so 43 years ago. Jesus. Uh, you know, sometimes you don't have a memory that goes all that far. But uh, so I, I do remember that every story was really good. And uh, I always enjoy anything that Alan E. Norse writes. Uh, another book. By him is Raiders from the Rings. That's Pyramid Book number F923 with a really nice Jack Gorgan cover. Um, this is from first first pyramid printing from 1963. Raiders from the Rings. And this is like he did uh, also books with space pirates and um, uh, uh, aliens from uh, from Saturn's rings. What happens here is there's a uh, uh, Earth has uh, has colonized uh, planets other outside this in the solar system uh, in, in around Saturn and uh, uh, around that area and on the asteroid belts and the uh, there's a conflict in the future between. Uh, the people of Earth and the and the colony settlements. So there's uh, the raiders are uh, from the rings are, are kind of fighting with with Earth, and there's uh, a lot of conflict and action and adventure in that. Uh, next one is one that I read, and I, I'm, 
uh, years ago again, and I, I mean, I loved it. Um, is Trouble on Titan, Lancer Book 72, 159. This one's from 1967, but it was a reprint of uh, a 1954 uh, novel that uh, probably it was uh, from McKay. And uh, Trouble on Titan, That's, it has a great, great cover. I mean, the cover art is terrific. I don't know who did the cover, but uh, it's really, it's really excellent. And this is a uh, kind of a similar theme with um, miners who are uh, mining the moon, uh, Saturn's moon of Titan, and uh, which is uh, which was one of it was one of the largest larger moons, um, and um, they are living there, and they're, um, there's a, like a kind of a independence and uh, interplanetary trouble brewing between Earth and the people on, on Titan, and um, it's kind of a, a, a revolution war going uh, that's going to break out between the, the uh, Earth and, and, this, and the colonies. That was like a kind of a theme that uh, also ran in um, uh, a lot of Norse's books. Uh, uh, rebellion, uh, uh, settlements that were uh, uh, of Earth that were uh, in, in, different, in different planets or, or different moons, and then uh, uh, there would be like rebellion between uh, uh, them and the, uh, the people out there and the, and the people on Earth, which is, you know, common sense, kind of like what happened with, uh, with uh, England and the United States and uh, also Spain and all of her colonies in the New World. Uh, once the colonies become uh, more self-sufficient and uh, and all they they want to break away and they want more autonomy and they want more independence that was a theme in his in his work and uh, it also happened amongst usually the uh, the asteroids and and uh, the, the the nearer planets that had to do with mining because that was a a, a, a way for uh, economic uh, you know there had to be a reason for uh, us going out there and us being on these planets, and if there was if mining would be uh, would work, then that would uh, uh, be the reason why uh, these areas would be able to uh, exist. And um, another one of his uh, books, um, the uh, paperback, the uh, the hardcover is from 1957, and it was. It was Rocket to Limbo. This is the hardcover. And it's a uh, David McKay book from 1957. And the, um, it was also reprinted as an ace book, a paperback, number D385 in 1959. So here's these two. And uh, Rocket to Limbo is basically a, um, a story about uh, a young a young guy who uh, uh, is a space he wants to be a space explorer and he's his wish is granted he's uh, he, he's able to um, to partner up with a, um, a famous uh, space explorer who uh, is well known and uh, well respected and he. Uh, he 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 he's a young guy who who looks up to this guy and they and they go out to uh they're supposed to go to vega to um uh, to uh explore some area out there uh, the problem is is that uh there's also a planet called wolf that uh is extremely dangerous and that is um uh it's kind of like in star trek the uh the prime directive uh, the planet wolf no no humans are supposed to go to wolf but uh, what happens is the uh, the young guy's mentor uh, says, you know, we're going to Wolf because we're going to discover the aliens that are there and let's find out why, um, you know, uh, no no people are allowed, no no explorers or no uh, spacemen are allowed to to go to that planet. So it's that's the whole story behind that, and it's really it's really a terrific book. Uh, this is the Ace Double, is backed with uh, Echo in the Skull by John Brunner, another terrific science fiction writer. So that's the other side of that ace double. But the Rocket to the Rocket to Limbo is a terrific book. It uh, is a picture of Alan E. Norse. He was a uh, young doctor and he uh, went on a sabbatical to write 
books, science fiction books, uh, specifically, uh, you know, with uh, young people, juveniles, and uh, uh, you know, young people as the as the heroes as the main um, main people. This my copy here has a. Uh, it's interesting. It was given to me by a gift by a very loving person, generous person. Um, interesting thing is that uh, the book had a uh, letter uh, uh, with it. Now the letter is from the book is 1957, but the the letter is from 1954. So uh, what happens is that uh, a man named James M. Harper from uh, Pennsylvania. In 1954, wrote Alan E. Norse, uh, who lived in Philadelphia at the time, a letter, and uh, Norse wrote back to him. And it's a really cool, really cool item. Here's the letter with the uh, three cent stamp at that time in 1954. And here is the letter. This is from Alan E. Norse. And it's signed, signed Alan, dear Jim, signed Alan. And I'll read it to you now. We'll see. Uh, look at, look back at uh, a little bit of uh, science fiction correspondence uh, from 1954. Alan E. Norris to Jim Harper, uh, dear Jim, sorry to have been. T it's Monday night. Uh, it's dated Monday night. Uh, dear Jim, sorry to have been tied up the other night. We wonder if you could come in for dinner either tomorrow, Tuesday night, or the next night. If you can come tomorrow, just appear before around 7, for we are having a roast and dinner will be late. Or if you're tied up at dinner time, but can come in for the evening, give us a call. Paid a very well-timed visit to Liz Morton at Winston this afternoon. Winston is... Uh, the juvenile uh, publisher. They published Heinlein. They published a lot of uh, science fiction for juveniles and young adults at the time. So I paid a uh, time, time to visit to Liz Morton at this time, this afternoon. She's signing herself yours, Betty, these days. And it looks like if I can womp up another book outline for their science fiction series, I might get in under the wire. They're discontinuing the series pretty much at this time. So I am busy womping with the barest rudiments of a plot and a conflict or two, we'll see what comes out the other end. We'd like very much to read your carbon, and we are looking forward to seeing you. Best, Alan. And this is from, from Alan E. Norse to a fan in 1954. I think it's really cool, and it belongs with this, with the, with this book. And uh, again, I don't know who did the cover art for the for the hardcover by McKay from 1957. Here's a picture of Norse again. Kind of uh, going back into time. This back cover lists other books in this, in in the series that they published for adventure adventure stories for boys, including one by uh, the White Company by uh, Arthur Conan Doyle. So there you have that. And uh, next, as I said, um, it's interesting because uh, Norse was a doctor and he wrote a lot of um, medical, uh, you know, uh, science fiction. So uh, it, it, a lot of his science fiction had to do with medicine in the future. And one of his uh, books that came out in uh, 1975 cover art by Carl Swanson, by the way. Um, actually, it came out in 74 by uh, David McKay in hardcover, and the, the first uh, paperback printing was in 19, December 1975 by uh, Ballantine Books, uh, number 24654, and it was called Blade Runner. Now, some of you may, uh, may, uh, uh, have some uh, thought about that title because that title is very interesting. Anyway, in Blade Runner, you have a book that uh, is talk talks about health control laws, mandatory sterilization, computer-directed robot surgeons, all part of the 21st century world that is immun immunizing its way to disaster. 
and in Blade Runner, uh, it's a story of Billy Gimp, who was a blade, who was a Blade Runner, and that's one of the shadowy procurers of illegal medical supplies for the rapidly expanding nightmare world of the medical black market. He's a skilled surgeon, and he's using his powers to uh, to help poor and people that uh, in the future in this future world where uh, medicine is uh, is kind of uh, kind of beyond the control of, of most people. An uh, interesting thing about Blade Runner is uh, you'll recognize the title as being uh, associated with what I said when we uh, opened up this episode, that uh, we're talking about Al Alan Norris, and we're going to talk about uh, something that has to do with Philip K. Dick, and that's, and that's Blade Runner. So... Philip K. Dick's movie, and this is uh, Harrison Ford, this is the movie edition uh, of Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? Um, when they made the movie, they never titled it that. They, they looked for another title, and the title that they looked for and that they settled on was Blade Runner. So what they did was, interesting thing is, um, the motion picture company bought the rights to this book by Alan E. Norris. They didn't want to make the book into a movie. They just bought basically the title. And the interesting thing is that they paid him more money for just the use of the title of this book than Norris got paid for the book itself or for any other book that he wrote. And, uh, it's kind of interesting that uh, that that title became the title for Blade Runner for the movie Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, uh, and that was uh, Philip K. Dick's first movie. And that's the this is the Valentine book from from May '82. Originally, the, the book was from 1968. And the interesting thing, just to add a little bit about Philip K. Dick, which is you know, kind, of, uh, kind of sad, but I think it should be mentioned. Um, Blade Runner, or do, or do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, was the first movie that was ever made from uh, one of his books. Uh, it, was a, it went on to be a successful movie, a cult movie, underground classic, and... Um, as time went on, um, many movies were made from the stories and books of, uh, of Phil K. Dick. So you had uh, Paycheck, you had Total Recall, and you had uh, um, um, you also had um, the series, the TV series based on uh, on um, On the, um, the on World War Two, um, we'll put it in the description when you remember. Yeah, it. which, I, which uh, I can't believe I forgot it. I should have some notes. Um, anyway, all of those all of those uh, movies, uh, Dick never saw uh, never saw the movie. He, he, he didn't live long enough to see Blade Runner or Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep come out in the movies. He never lived long enough to see Paycheck or um, The Man in the High Castle TV series. That's the one I was trying to think of, The Man in the High Castle. Or Paycheck or Total Recall or any of the other uh, books that were um, future, the future crime uh, movie. Um, uh, all of those. You know, and Minority he would've, Report. Minority Report. And, he would've, and, and, there's, and there's others. Uh, I just wonder how he would have felt had he lived, you know, five or ten years longer. And, and first of all, he would have, you know, to, to, to have known that his work was that valued that, and that popular. And also to, to, to be made into movies and to, to, to make money. I mean, he, he never really made a lot of money. He was kind of living hand to mouth, I think, as a, 
as a science fiction writer. He was a paperback science fiction writer. Most of his books all only appeared in paperback originals and in, uh, in science fiction magazine, digest magazines. Um, he never really uh, achieved the, uh, the fame while he was alive that he really deserved. But uh, that's, uh, that's the same thing kind of with, uh, with Alan E. Norse. Alan E. Norse was, was a terrific writer who, um, whose stories were, you know, always, always touched me when I read them uh, as, as a kid and a young adult. And um, it's kind of ironic that uh, he, his book was, was kind of linked, his book, The Blade Runner, was linked with Blade Runner by uh, Philip K. Dick, the movie and that he actually received more money for the, uh, for the use of the title of the book, just the title, than he got paid for the, for the book itself and for any other book that he ever wrote. And uh, it's just one of those like little ironic things that, that happen in publishing and it's kind of especially in science fiction. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, the best thing is that uh, both of these authors, Alan E. Norris and Philip K. Dick, uh, left us uh, incredible, terrific, wonderful uh, stories and books and novels that, uh, you know, if you're not reading any of them or if you haven't read them, you should read them. And if you have read them, you'll know what I mean. So I hope you enjoyed this little look at uh, the work of Alan E. Norris and uh, some, just some of my favorite paperback books. Uh, sampling of his paperbacks and the little bit of the Philip K. Dick connection and uh, hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, give it a thumbs up and a like and uh, thanks for looking and I hope to see you again.